on this Thursday night. The American people spoke and demanded a new dawn. A seismic shift in Washington. The Democrats take back the House, leaving government divided. Hopefully we're going to work together and we're going to get lots of things done. But after months of fighting, can anything really change? It might be a further escalation to, to cancel. Canadian MPs and senators are heading to China just as Beijing's words about the detained Canadians get harsher. The delicate dance ahead. Marqua holds and shoots and look at it makes the save. A disappointing loss sets off a torrent of ugly comments online, but then a change in tone. Hold your head up high. Canada loves you. Well, it's something to smile about. This is The National. As tumultuous as the last two years have been, we're about to enter a new and almost certainly more contentious era in the presidency of Donald Trump. Today, a new U.S. Congress was sworn in and Democrats took control of the House of Representatives, ending the Republican Party's total grip on power in Washington. As Paul Hunter reports, the new House leader isn't wasting any time taking on the president. And that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you're about to enter, so help you God. I do. Congratulations, <laughs> Madam Speaker. It is the third most powerful political position in America, Speaker of the House of Representatives, and it makes Democrat Nancy Pelosi now, in effect, leader of the Donald Trump opposition. As of today, she and her party control this place. And while much has been made of all the newly elected fresh faces, a record number of women on Capitol Hill and more diversity than ever, today the real focus was on Pelosi, who signaled she's set to take on Trump, not least his divisive policies on immigration. On that, Pelosi quoted a revered Republican. He said, if we ever close the door to new Americans, our leadership role in the world will soon be lost. Ronald Reagan. But the to-do list for Democratic lawmakers is a lengthy one. Today, Pelosi pledged action on climate change to strengthen gun control, to lower the cost of health care and more. As for the president, the key question is, what about him? It's believed Democrats also want laws protecting special counsel Robert Mueller. As well, provisions forcing all presidential candidates to hand over their tax returns. And there's already talk of a push, yes, to impeach Donald Trump. Democrats can now also launch congressional investigations, and they're likely to examine whether Trump has obstructed justice, profited from being in office, broken campaign finance laws, and cheated on his taxes. It's a new political world for the president. Uh, if he's having a struggle with the old political world where Republicans had a majority in the House and Senate, get ready for a new day. Then there's that border wall, sticking point in the ongoing partial government shutdown. Trump himself today stunned reporters with his first ever trip to the White House briefing room to press Democrats into signing off on tax money to build that wall. Without a very for strong form of barrier, Call it what you will, but without a wall, you cannot have border security. It won't work. Said Pelosi tonight, he'll get not a penny for it. As both sides brace for a bitter period of hard-nosed, toe-to-toe -to -toe battling and deep-dive investigation into all of it. It begins now. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. One of the Democrats' first orders of business, passing a bill to end the partial government shutdown, but it's not expected to survive the Republican Senate or a presidential veto. And after 13 days, the shutdown's impact is growing. We are, and I need to use the bathroom. The most noticeable impact is at parks and monuments. You can see it, you can smell it too. These porta potties are so disgusting. That includes in the U.S. Capitol, where the overflowing toilets and trash cans are not a good look. And sometimes it's what you can't see. The Smithsonian's museums and zoo are closed. It's panda cam, even less exciting than usual. But it's more than an inconvenience. 800,000 federal workers are at least temporarily out of a paycheck. I'll have to make a tough choice between, you know, paying uh, my utilities or going and buying groceries. The D.C. Marriage Bureau is furloughed, so people can't officially tie the knot. 
Federally guaranteed business loans aren't getting processed. Federally funded research has ground to a halt. And immigration courts are closed. Affecting those trying to cross legally into the United States. And there is no sign that any of this will end anytime soon. Blunt words from Beijing today on two Canadian detainees. The country's top prosecutor says he is certain they broke the law. China's hard line means neither the legal drama nor the diplomatic battle are anywhere near being over. But that's not stopping a group of Canadian MPs and senators from heading to China this week. Katie Simpson explains what they're planning. News of worsening tensions between Canada and China is not enough to stop a group of parliamentarians from heading to Shanghai on Saturday. At the end of the day, if there was a, a risk, uh, we wouldn't be going. Conservative MP Michael Cooper is one of six legislators going on a bipartisan multi-city mission to promote business ties and improve relations between countries. The head of our a delegation did uh, speak with officials from Global Affairs Canada and uh, the message that they sent was that it would be better that we go than not go. In fact, it might be a further escalation to, to cancel. Canada has already postponed one high-level trip to China. Tourism Minister Melanie Jolie paused plans for a December visit because of the diplomatic dispute. It all began when China arrested former diplomat Michael Kovrig and entrepreneur Michael Spavor and accused the Canadian men of endangering Chinese national security. Their detention is widely seen as retaliation for Canada's arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. In China's strongest statement yet, the country's top prosecutor insisted there is no doubt the two Canadians violated Chinese laws and regulations. Canada rejects the claims and is demanding Kovrig and Spaver be released. The upcoming parliamentary visit will be a fresh opportunity for Canadians to make that case in person. It's important that there be as many lines of contact with China now as possible. It's not a time to cut things off. More communication is what a powerful American lawmaker is calling for as well. Democratic Senator Mark Warner, a prominent China critic, says the Trump administration needs to step up on behalf of Ottawa. I think we need to do more to uh, bring our pressure as well as other of our allies' pressure to bear on trying to get these uh, Canadian citizens released. Global Affairs confirms 13 Canadians have been arrested by Chinese authorities since this dispute began. The number may seem high, but senior sources say that's about average for a month in China. But the arrests of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver are unusual, given the serious allegations made against them. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So China is making waves in foreign affairs. It's also made a major market impact. Today, the Dow, S&P and Nasdaq all shed between 2 and 3 percent. Now, this after markets digested the news of disappointing results from tech giant Apple. Its stock alone dropped 10 percent. The reason, according to Apple CEO, China. And so as we look at what's going on in China, the it's clear that the economy began to slow there. China is, by some measures, already the world's biggest economy. It doesn't just make stuff these days, it buys stuff. Early last year, GM sold 30% more cars in China than it did in the U.S. Starbucks was opening up a new store there every 15 hours. But over the past six months, experts have noticed a major shift. We're seeing weakness in the consumer sector. We're seeing weakness in manufacturing activity and weakness when it comes to general business investment as well. And the breadth of that weakness across all of these sectors means that it's not an isolated incident. This really is an economy that's slowing down faster than we would have expected. Why? Well, some point to the trade war between the U.S. and China. By placing tariffs on foreign imports of steel and aluminum. Tit-for-tat tariffs have taken a bit of a bite, but the roots of China's slowdown may be deeper. To me, this is really just a cut on top of an already broken arm. China is really moving from a manufacturing, industrial-based economy to a consumer-based economy. That transition means the kind of sedate growth you see in developed economies. In fact, Beijing has been trying to engineer the transition, for example, by 
tapping the brakes on credit. We know that China is going to slow over the long run, but what we're hoping is that it's a smooth transition. And if we see economic numbers like we did this week out of China, the concern is that it's not smooth at all. It's a bumpy ride and maybe one that we're going a little too quickly down. So it's easy to see how bad Apple results have rippled through markets around the world. If Chinese growth hits a wall, everyone will feel it. And eyes will be on not just Washington, but Beijing to see what they do next. It's possible that economic slowdown may be part of the reason China isn't making a bigger fuss about this next achievement, domestically at least. It didn't even lead the evening newscast, even though it's history. China managed to land a craft on the dark side of the moon. And as Breyer Stewart tells us, this is proof of China's ambitions on the world stage and above it. Scientists with China's National Space Administration watched the final moments before touchdown. The probe landed accurately and steadily, hitting the bullseye, he says. It's target the largest, deepest and oldest crater, and it's on the side of the moon that never faces Earth. Because of that, scientists can't communicate directly with the probe. In May, they launched a satellite to relay messages and transmit images. This is a fairly new uh, installation for us here at the observatory. And it's those pictures Edward Bloomer is so excited about. He's an astronomer with Britain's Royal Observatory. For lots of members of the public, it's going to be really interesting in terms of I mean, fundamentally getting cool pictures back. Both the lander and the rover are equipped with cameras. They were launched back in December. The entire mission hasn't been well publicized, even in China. These things are expensive and they are complicated and they take a lot of effort. You don't always necessarily want to be shouting about things um, that are that expensive and complicated um, that might not work. But it did work and is being heralded as a milestone. Unlike other missions, China's probe has landed on a part of the moon that has been unexplored. It's going to be surveying the geology and conducting biological experiments, and experts say it plays into China's greater ambitions to be a space superpower. China wants to position itself as a global leader, both politically and when it comes to scientific and technological advances. Joining the space race is part of meeting that goal. Well, they want to put humans on the moon, so they want to build a moon base. And that's, that's what they're working towards, and they're collecting data to find out is that going to be physically possible. And because this mission has so far been a success, experts say it's only going to encourage more competition to explore the still unseen corners of space. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. They're designed to take clothing donations, not lives. But at least seven Canadians, five of them in British Columbia, have died in donation bins. The latest this week in West Vancouver. People crawl or fall in and then they can't get out. Now, as Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, some communities are banishing the bins. I cried. I couldn't believe it. The news of yet another death in a clothing donation bin hit Loretta Sundstrom hard. Her 45-year-old daughter, Anita Hawk, died in 2015 after getting stuck in a bin in Maple Ridge, B.C. She was homeless and collected clothes from bins for other homeless people. She would bring them to my house and wash them if they weren't clean or if they had a smell to them. And she would give them away to whoever needed them. Sundstrom says something has to be done about the bins. Shut them all down and then get a designer and redesign these things. The latest tragedy happened in West Vancouver. A 34-year-old man died on Sunday in a bin similar to this one. The city has now closed all bins. I think the next step has to be investigating different bin designs or modifications of these bins. And the city of Vancouver issued a statement late today saying about 90% have been removed. Any remaining bins will be removed in early 2019 and that alternative options are available to donate used clothing, including thrift stores. But those who work with vulnerable people say action should have been taken long ago everywhere. Because this is a national issue to make sure that we have the bins that are helping people, but also just make sure they're not going to take anybody's life. Engineers are working on ways to make safer donation bins. I think Anita would still be here if that design would have been made a long time ago. 
In the meantime, Sundstrom hopes no one else will die the way her daughter did. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Vancouver. And tonight, the nonprofit group that owns the bin involved in Sunday's death said it's removing 146 of the bins across the province. Inclusion BC says last year it asked university engineering students to work on safer designs and that those designs are now in the prototype phase. Well, here's another urban danger. Imagine driving down a highway and this lands on your windshield. That sheet of plywood came loose from a truck and smashed into this car. The good news is the three women in the car got away with just small cuts, scratches, and bruises. But as you can imagine, it was terrifying. Tonight, the driver of that car is our witness. And I saw something is flying from a truck and it goes straight to my car. And within a, maybe less than 30 seconds, it's uh, just came to my car, hit my car, and it comes in my car. And uh, even, like, uh, I got a hit uh, in my arm. And uh, at the moment, they are saying, like, uh, you have a blood in your head, too. And right away, I called 911. And within a two minute, they they all on there. And I saw, like, she's bleeding, too. I just feel like, oh, I'm, luckily, I'm alive. And uh, I saw like lots of cars crossing me at the moment. And I was on the highway, busy highway, right? In front of, uh, like, just middle of the highway. And no one is stopping. That's the thing I saw and I shocked. Some other stories we're following tonight on The National. A 15-year-old girl has died after jumping from a ski lift in the Abitibi region of Quebec. Police say she and her friend deliberately jumped off before reaching the top last night, but the teenager didn't realize she was landing on a snow-covered rock. The resort was closed today, but says it will reopen tomorrow. We are tracking a major storm in British Columbia. Up to 90 millimeters of rain has fallen across Metro Vancouver since yesterday. Rainfall warnings still in effect. And that rain meant heavy snow for the mountains. An extreme avalanche risk is in place for most of BC's southern mountains. The same storm has also prompted wind and heavy snowfall warnings through the Rockies in Alberta. And another storm we're watching for, this one is set to hit Thailand. This resort island, normally bustling with tourists, but the storm has forced thousands to flee. It's expected to strike the southern coast tomorrow with heavy rain, strong winds, and huge waves. Still ahead on the national. It's Thursday. That means that issue. And now that we're in an election year, Rosie puts your questions to the game. And how a Canadian teen who just scored a huge win on the tennis court is inspiring players back home. I think that it just inspires me that like that nothing's impossible and you can always um, like achieve your goals and your dreams as long as you like work hard and you stay focused like she does. Canada's Bianca Andreescu is 18 and riding high after the biggest win of her career. She just defeated Caroline Wozniacki, ranked number three in the world. Not bad for someone who entered this tournament ranked 152nd. Her impressive win is drawing a lot of attention in the tennis world and she's inspiring other young women who dream of that sort of breakthrough. Olivia Stefanovic has their reaction. If you didn't know her name before, get ready to hear a lot more about Bianca Andreescu. She's into the quarterfinals in Auckland after a truly, truly brilliant performance. The 18-year-old from Mississauga, Ontario, just beat the player ranked third highest in the world. I can't believe it right now. I mean, I've dreamt of playing on the stage against top players, and now I'm here. Her storybook performance made all the more stunning since she was coughing during the match and recovering from back issues. I just fought till the end. I texted her this morning, and I just say two thumbs up. Her win isn't surprising, though, to Andre Labelle, 
who's been coaching her since she was 15. She has been saying that all these years. My goal is to become number one in the world. I like to have girls that are thinking, uh, you know, they want to be the best, and she's 100% committed behind her career. Her ambition and talent are already being felt on the courts where she trains. Well, I think that it just inspires me that, like, that nothing's impossible and you can always, um, like, achieve your goals and your dreams. It's the mentality and it's how hard you work to become who you want to be. For LaBelle, that's just what he wants to hear. For them to see, you know, what she's capable of doing, you know, and I think it's really help. It's showing a path, you know, that uh, actually you can succeed. Andreescu now faces Venus Williams in the tournament, seen as a warm-up to the prestigious Australian Open. But before they play... First, I have to swallow this one and then we'll think about tomorrow. But I'm honestly really excited just being here. She's taking it all in as those back home wait eagerly to see how far she'll go. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, Rosie and the Ad Issue Gang take us into 2019 with a look ahead to some of the big political stories. And this time, some of you asked the questions. My question for the At Issue panel is, have we already seen what will become the main ballot box issue for the election? Or is it yet to come? At Issue is next, but first. In case you missed it, a Canadian rock star from the 70s has reunited with a trusty old friend. These are the pickups that I put in. Miles Goodwin, co-founder of one of Canada's greatest rock bands, April Wine, fell in love with this Gibson melody maker on Cape Breton Island 50 years ago. Together, they hit the big time. I used it up until 1972 on April Wine's, uh, two of April Wine's records. And it would have been played on this guitar. Could have been a lady was a breakthrough hit in Canada and the United States. But then there was a truck crash and Goodwin was told his guitar was busted. Goodwin thought his treasure was gone forever until... I got a message on Facebook the 24th of December 2018 saying, I know where your guitar is, your melody maker. I said, yeah, in heaven. <laughs> no, it's in Victoria, BC. It was his all right, his name right there on the head. All that was missing was the memories. This was, in one case, in a living room as a conversation piece for 15 years. And uh, it missed out on years of all the great April wine hits like Roller. I would have played Roller on this back then. Yeah. I would have been, it would have played it on this, but I didn't, <laughs> you know? But I did play. My question for the at issue panel. This is my question for the at issue panel. My question for the at issue panel is. My question for the at issue panel. My question for the at issue panel is. 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 We put out a call and you guys delivered. So tonight we are going to answer some of your questions, some of the viewer questions that you sent in. Althea, Paul, Chantal, and Andrew all here with me in studio in Toronto. And this handy dandy prop that our producers have come up with. You know that I do at issue roulette. It's, we're so high tech here at the CBC. <laughs> so that's how I'll determine who gets to answer the first question. And the first question comes from Sarah Stroder in Yellowknife. My question for the at issue panel is have we already seen what will become the main ballot box issue for the election or is it yet to come? All right, I'm spinning it. I'm really doing that. It Maybe it might take too long, so I'm only going to do it once. <laughs> Andrew, uh, the issue for the next election, do we know it or is it yet to come? Uh, we don't know it. I'm not sure it is yet to come because I actually reject the whole idea of there being a ballot box issue. This is something that we in the media get sucked into because the parties definitely have their preferred ballot box issue and they try to imprint it upon our brains. But there's 17 million voters out there and each of them has their own ballot yeah. box issue. But is it not true that things get galvanized a little bit and start to everyone starts to talk yes, about this? Yes, but the same you've issue? got 
<clears throat> regardless of, of specific issues, you've got trends. For instance, I don't believe that this will be an election where change or the move for change will be sure, okay. a huge factor, not like Ontario and Quebec, because this is a government that only has had one term. But beyond that, uh, competence comes into play. And once you've looked at all the issues, the question will be, yeah. who do I trust to be prime minister? And that is the question that comes back in every uh, election. That's smart, Paul. I suspect we actually have seen the issue that will, that will drive most of the decisions of uh, undecided voters in the next election. We just don't know what it is yet. It's like an Agatha <laughs> Christie novel. Will it be? Will it be Professor Climate Change? Will it be Miss Migration? Will it be uh, Doctor Affordability? Uh, stay tuned for the last act when when Hercule Poirot will will reveal again, everything. That, that's a, such a small sliver of the vote is people who are choosing between the Conservatives and the Liberals. Lots of people are going to vote NDP, not even wanting them to be the government. Right. People have a million different reasons for voting. Okay. I agree with Chantal. I think trust and competence is really what's going to be at stake in the election. I also think there can be side issues like <coughs> migration, like climate change, like guns. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, even electoral reform for some people yeah. might speak to trust and competence. Can you trust Justin Trudeau if yeah. he broke his promise the last time? Uh, there may also be things that we don't see come on the horizon. Like, you know, there's now talk that we might see a global recession coming in the later stages of 2019. Yeah. Well, that changes the tone about maybe people didn't really care about deficits, but maybe they will mm -hmm. start caring mm -hmm. about deficits and debt yeah. a little bit more strongly than they do. It also right depends. Now. It also depends, I think, probably on where you live, too, for all of those yes, issues. Of okay, next, uh, next question is for, I'm going to spin it as I'm watching because otherwise it'll take too long. Travis Mitchell in Brampton, Ontario. Go ahead, Travis. My question for the ad issue panel is how much disruption is the PPC likely to cause in the next election and for the Conservative Party in particular? So, I'll go to you, Chantal. You, you came up on my spinner. We don't know is the short answer. It's too early uh, to tell, for sure. Um, Maxime Bernier is mostly fishing in conservative waters, which is unnerving for the conservatives. He's doing well in those waters in places like Saskatchewan and Alberta, where there is not a lot of destruction that he can wreak on the mm -hmm. conservatives because they have such a wide base. Mm -hmm. So the real question is, to me, will he be a factor in Ontario, where the battle will be competitive and will go a long way to determine whether it's a majority, a minority, a liberal or a conservative government? And if he is a factor in Ontario, that will be bad news for Andrew Scheer. What do you think, Andrew? I suspect more than perhaps we might uh, estimate at this time. And I say that by looking at the Conservatives' body language. You know, in the last few weeks, Scheer has been taking positions on, for example, sort of targeting the media, which he then backed away from a little bit, uh, particularly on the Global Migration yeah. Pact, which was this issue from the fever swamp of the, of the right-wing blogosphere. It, it, that looks like a party that's worried about that he might make inroads in, and they're trying to cover that off. I 100% agree with what Andrew just said. I think the fact that Andrew Scheer came out and took such a decisive stand on the global migration comeback, which really was not anything that you know people at the grocery store seem to be talking about, but there was a move and MPs offices were being bombarded from calls. It was on social media channels. And Maxime Bernier was going to rallies and saying, I'm the only political party that's willing to stand up on this issue. The conservatives are not willing to do this. And they took that away from him. They would not have done that if they did not feel that they were creating a wedge issue between him, themselves and Mr. Bernier. So I do think they are a little bit worried about maybe that their people won't be as mobilized to come out to the polls. More of that than really that he's going to capture, you know, that 1% of polls or maybe two or three yeah. that is going to really impact their chances in the next election. Mr. Wells. I'd be real surprised surprised if the margin of liberal victory over the conservatives in the next election if that's how it ends up is smaller than the vote of the of Maxime Bernier's party in other words I, I I'll be real surprised if Maxime Bernier by himself is enough to lose this election for the conservatives so conservatives are, are going to win despite him or they're going to lose and he wouldn't have helped if he if he'd stayed on board but one of the things conservatives have to do in the interim like I, I, I can't predict their behavior next September but right now they need to act like the party that Maxime Bernier voters can come back home to yeah. if they give up on Bernier. So they can't denigrate the, the party or its members yeah. or, or their choices. And they have to sound um, 
at least halfway acceptable on some of their issues. Why though? And because a lot of those people don't seem like they actually voted. Well, in the last it's, uh, Althea, it's on a list of things that, that a complex party has to do in complex times. They also have to uh, take liberal votes. They also have to <laughs> appeal to orange blue switchers in Saskatchewan. They got to do a million things. Yes, but this is on the list of things, things they got to do. But, but to, to remain attractive to a conservative fringe, because it is mostly that, yeah. they are going to be losing the votes that they need from the the, the, the liberals that they need to pull out. And, and at I, some point. I heard people say that about Stephen Harper four campaigns in a row. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to let's move on to question three. We'll agree to disagree on that one. Michael Sad in Colehurst, Alberta, asks this. Hi, I'm Mike from Colehurst, Alberta, Canada. My question for the ad issue panel is: What, in the panel's opinion, uh, is the biggest threat facing uh, Canadian unity and federalism heading into 2019? Okay, Althea, you. Well, he's from Alberta, and I think really right now that's where most of the fervor that's uh, anti-federation seems to be coming from. Uh, there is no huge threat coming from Quebec. I think there's no real threat coming from Alberta either, but I think there's a lot of disenchantment, mm -hmm. and that speaks to a lot of what Rachel Notley is doing and certainly for what Jason Kenney is doing as well. It's going to be very difficult for uh, whoever is prime minister to reconcile Alberta's expectations on the pipeline development front and the resistance in places like Quebec and BC and, and that could lead to a fairly acrimonious time. It already is mm -hmm. at this point. Well, and, and you were at the first minister's meeting, Paul, this year, and it was that was apparent that it wasn't just one place that the prime minister is having trouble with. It's it's different places for different reasons, and some of them starting to gang up on him. Yeah, I mean, so to 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 riff on the viewer's question, yeah. it's becoming increasingly clear, if it was not already clear, that Quebec is not a short-term threat to national unity. Mm -hmm. Francois Legault is not interested in playing that game. Uh, and everyone's trying to be his friend. The extent to which Alberta is a, is a, is a real threat, um, you know, I expect it's going to, there's going to be a lot of heat around these same issues by next summer because there's a very good chance that yeah. Jason Kenney, who's a superb political operator, who's, uh, these are all his issues, and he's going to be looking to demonstrate that he can make a difference, you know, he's, he's going to be in the, uh, in the equation. I'll be really curious to see if Jason Kenney can be more effectual on these issues than Rachel Notley has. We'll find out. Well, he certainly will be uh, probably louder. I, I would say he's better at taking up space. That she is doing that, but I, I, I would argue More combative, but maybe less constructive. Yeah, maybe. He's coming there. He will absolutely be coming with his yeah. boxing gloves on. Look, it, Alberta's uh, a very angry place right now. If it turns out that we are unable to get a pipeline mm -hmm. built, uh, if, if people in Alberta are told, sorry, your, your oil is just going to be shut in we, because the federal government can't exercise its responsibilities and, and, and get interprovincial infrastructure built, even aside from the economic impact of that, I just think, you know, the, symbolic, the symbol, symbolism of it mm -hmm. uh, and what it says about Alberta's place in the federation yeah. would be absolutely lethal. Yeah, that's the, dangerous. There are liberals who are still hoping in the timeline that they can get shovels back in the ground for the Trans Mountain expansion when the construction season resumes. Whether that's optimistic, wishful thinking, I can't tell you, but they are still hoping to campaign against the background of yes. shovels in the ground. But, but they, they are up against the reality that they have to do this meaningful consultation with First Nations, and if First Nations say, we need more time. I don't know how they get around the, that. The right? shovels in the ground, by the way, will not save them in Alberta. No, but it no, will. I it sends, a, it sends a signal. It, it I wasn't suggesting that, yeah. but, yeah. It, but it will be a more positive situation than it is now. That's and right. the courts did suggest it need not be a lengthy process. That's right. Okay, uh, we have a question from a young journalist starting his career in Minnesota, of all places. His question is about the rhetoric of the U.S. president toward journalists. Here he is. I wonder how the rhetoric is viewed in Canada and um, how that is seen uh, from there and what it means for covering politics. And that is Alex Veneman in Minnesota. You want to start, Paul? At a minimum, when the president calls uh, uh, the press the enemies of the people, it makes me sad. Uh, and it does make me worry for a lot of my colleagues down there who I think are in real danger of physical attack from people who, 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 who take these things the wrong way. I also think that this is, to some extent, the, the, the scapegoating of journalists is uh, kind of an eternal thing that journalists have to face. I mean, my first couple of weeks as a, as, a, as a reporter for the Montreal Gazette, I, I covered some demonstration by truckers in the middle of nowhere in Quebec, and some guy came real close to knocking my block off because he was mad about reporters. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it's the sort of thing that people in positions of responsibility 
uh, should not uh, provoke through their words and actions. Unfortunately, right now, the presidency of the United States is not a position of responsibility. Do we see that, those percolating in any way? I, I know you alluded to the little moment where Andrew Scheer thought, maybe I'm going to go down this road and then didn't. But do we see it percolating here, that kind of rhetoric? Uh, every once in a while, the Conservatives will send a fundraising note uh, saying that the Liberal media in Ottawa is against them. But we have not seen at all, and I do not think we will see from the Conservatives the type of language that we see uh, from the President of the United States, which is a good thing. Um, I think the Prime Minister and the Liberals have kind of, like they tend to do with many issues, kind of overreach sometimes to try to make a point. Yeah. And they are trying to make uh, journalism and journalists uh, kind of another one of these wedge issues that places them against Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think a lot of reporters, especially in Ottawa, are very uncomfortable <laughs> with, yes. uh, with their play yeah. on that. That actually goes back to Paul's issue about values, trying to suggest that journalism, democracy, accountability is a liberal value. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. The, the conservatives have always complained about not getting a fair shake from the media, and with some justice. The sure. media does lean left. Uh, but this is entered an entirely different territory of, of outright demonization of not just skepticism about the media, which is well warranted. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of things wrong, but just blind rejectionism of everything that the media says must be wrong. I think in the Trump populist case, it's part of a broader rejection of knowledge and of elites and people who know stuff. So we're just one part of that. But it becomes particularly toxic, as Paul said, when political leaders, uh, not just Trump, but others, are, are kind of leading the chant uh, and making the, the press out to be not a flawed but necessary vehicle in, in democracy, but the enemy of the people. That has gone, you know, way off over the line. Yeah, last word to you. And I have seen so far no evidence that the serious conservatives who are indulging in that kind of language, when one of them does, if that happens, I'll decide that person is not a serious, responsible politician. Okay. Don't write me for these at issue roulette things. I can't get you one. This is a custom made, one of a kind thing. I can't even give it to you guys. Thank you all. Appreciate you being Thank here. You. Andrew, Chantal, Althea, and Paul. Still ahead on the national, finding hope in an image. We visit a community in northern Saskatchewan with a new photography club aimed at saving lives. And you just forget about everything. Because you're too busy looking at the beauty. Like you're too busy getting that perfect angle. It takes all your problems away. That camera can do a lot to one person. Among the stories we're watching tonight, the latest on the American, born in Canada, accused of spying by Russia. Paul Whelan has been formally charged with espionage and is now being held at this former KGB prison in Moscow. The charges carry a sentence of up to 20 years. His Russian defense lawyer says Whelan remains in a good mood, but says the detention is, quote, unwarranted. Whelan's family insists he's not a spy, saying the former U.S. Marine was in Moscow to attend a wedding when he was arrested last week. It has been three months since the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and today the trial of his alleged attackers got underway. Eleven men are facing charges, and prosecutors say they're seeking the death penalty for five of them. Ten other suspects are still under investigation. Khashoggi was killed in October inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. His remains have never been found. It is a statistic people across this country have been working to change for years. Suicide rates for Indigenous youth are up to seven times higher than for other young people in this country. Communities in northern Saskatchewan have been hit particularly hard in recent years, but a new program in a village 490 kilometres north of Saskatoon has hints of hope. CBC's Madeleine Kotzer has more on how Pine House discovered the healing power of photography. Skylar LaRiviere sees opportunities for photos almost everywhere. It's cool. Awesome. Looking up and down, the 16-year-old captures each snapshot with a careful confidence. On this cool fall day, she's with a group of amateur photographers. They're winding their way through boreal forest to the base of a waterfall to take pictures. A few months ago, it was a very different story. La Riviere was alone in the forest, ready to give up on life. She survived three suicide attempts in a span of six months. I almost pulled the trigger to my head, and but I just was like, I thought about it, like there's more to, to this than 
like what's happening right now. Like I have a purpose in life. La Riviere got help at the Northern Village of Pine House's medical centre. That's where she met Dre Irwin, a primary care nurse who invited her to join the Pine House Photography Club. Irwin discovered photography's therapeutic power during a painful breakup in 2015. The following year, he moved to Pine House, and one night, a routine trip to let his dog out turned into an awesome discovery. The sky was dancing over Pine House Lake. I remember looking up thinking, what the heck? What is out here? Are you kidding me? Irwin's Northern Lights photos started getting attention on Facebook from people in Pine House. Soon he realized photography could maybe help others who were struggling. <laughs> on clear nights like this one, the photographers are outside. For many of them, these meetings have warmed up their world. Everything happens for a reason, right? Louis Iron joined the club shortly after his stepfather took his own life. Things looked dark for a while. The 15-year-old became suicidal. But once he started taking pictures, his perspective started to change. I feel like God sent somebody to like create this group because it's actually really, really helping me a lot. Nights spent around the fire, taking photos, are a world away from the parties with drugs and alcohol. After seeing the difference photography was making, elders decided to introduce it into the community's addiction treatment program. Jenna Nata Megan was one of the first to pick up a camera. And you just forget about everything because you're too busy looking at the beauty. Like you're too busy getting that perfect angle. The 33-year-old mother of three is a recovering crack addict. She took thousands of photos of the son during her month in rehab. It takes all your problems away. That camera can do a lot to one person. The Pine House Photography Club has caught the attention of social workers across Canada, and it's received a substantial grant from the federal government to set up a studio space. For members like La Riviere, it's illuminating a pathway forward into the future. When I get older, I want to show them how much I like became stronger and better, like wiser. Madeline Kotzer, CBC News, Pine House, Saskatchewan. Coming up, our moment of the day. After that crushing World Juniors loss, some fans lose their perspective, crudely criticizing Team Canada's young captain. But we found plenty of fans with a much different message. You can be proud of what you've accomplished in this tournament. And do not let those hateful comments get you. I'm wishing you all the best. But first, a preview of an interview you'll see Sunday here on The National. Rosie sits down with comedian Rick Mercer to talk about his new book, Politics and Pot. One of the things you also talk about is, is marijuana. It is now legal. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you if you've been sp smoking. But... Well, you can because I don't smoke okay. marijuana. All right. Um, um, because of my religion. No, <laughs> I just don't. I just never have. Uh, I find it amazing that nothing happened. I know. It's just amazing. Nothing happened. Yeah. The other day, I'm at the airport, and the guy takes out his laptop. He takes out his like little plastic container of cannabis, oh, lays really? it on top of the laptop, puts his wallet there, puts his coat on top, goes to the scanner. Nothing's happened. I kind of equate it to, you know, finally getting air conditioning. And people say, we should have done this 15 years ago. This is fantastic. <laughs> Oh, and he's going to go with the captain, Comtois. It would have won Canada the game. Captain Max Comtois awarded a penalty shot in overtime at the World Junior quarterfinal. If only. Comtois holds and shoots and look at him, makes the save. Finland would go on to win and Canada eliminated. It's not the first one that uh, I missed. It's not going to be the last one. And, uh, you know, it has to hurt. Perhaps it won't surprise you that on social media, unhappiness among fans turned ugly. Some of it aimed at the young captain, just 19 years old. Worst ice hockey player I've ever seen. And a lot of it more crude. You effing useless bag of representatives for Comtois released a statement coming to his defense saying it is shameful and incomprehensible that a few cowards who can hide behind social media could make such vicious attacks on these young men's character after they battled their hearts out for their country. Well put, but if that wasn't enough to quiet the trolls, other social media users picked up the charge. Their messages of support for Comtois are our moment of the day. 
Hi, Maxine. You're a beast out there. Hold your head up high. As a French Canadian, I'm very proud that you are a captain. You can be proud of what you've accomplished in this tournament. Hey, Max. Hey, Max. Keep it up. Keep it up. We love you, buddy. As a Canadian, I'm proud of the efforts that you and your teammates gave at the World Junior Championships. You guys should be proud of your efforts as well. It was evident that you left absolutely nothing on the ice. Do not let those hateful comments get you. I'm wishing you all the best. Not the result that you wanted, uh, but you know, you grow and move on from this and you continue to stand tall with your heads up. We love you. Canada loves you. Fantastic messages there, Adrian. Listen, there's so much we could say, but let me start with these two points. The kid was born in 1999. He is just that, a kid, a young man, and it's just a hockey game. Sure, it would have been great if Canada won, but the lack of perspective from people, some people on social media, continues to astonish me. And it may be hard, but, but hopefully, you know, the good messages ring an, an awful lot mm -hmm. louder than the volume of the other ones. And, and, you know, the notion of keeping it classy, it's... Yesterday was interesting because last night uh, Sidney Crosby was really heckled by a Rangers fan so loudly, so persistently. People heard it across Madison Square Gardens. So, you know, he's at the top of his game. What did he do? He signed a stick and he said to the guy, good chirps. Uh, but next time, you know, take it easy on me. Again, keeping it classy, maybe that's the way to keep them quiet. I do not get the culture of standing up in a stadium and saying rude <laughs> things to people. Friendly criticism maybe, but the rude stuff I don't get. No one would accuse you of ever doing that. That is a national for January 3rd. Good night. Good night.